You're listening to Three Things to Know with Stephanie Haney, with experts and insiders on what you need to know in Northeast Ohio. Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to the Three Things to Know podcast. I'm Stephanie Haney, and I am so happy to have you here today. If you've been following along over the past couple of weeks, you know we've been doing a mini series on egg freezing. This is our third episode. This is something that is on the rise during the pandemic. We've seen more and more women, fertility clinics are saying, come in and do egg freezing cycles. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of those being people's kind of personal relationships were a little bit put on hold. That's something that we've also talked about on the Three Things to Know podcast. We've talked with dating experts about how people were making that work and really just the big impact that this has had on our lives, right? Well, throughout this egg freezing series, which is something I have experience with, I did this a couple of years ago. In our first episode, we talked about how you can know if you're a good candidate for egg freezing because there's a lot of testing that goes into it beforehand because it's a big commitment in terms of your time and your money, which is something we're going to talk about in just a moment. So we talked about that in the first episode, also including why those social media ads hawking those fertility tests, maybe not all they're cracked up to be. In the second episode, we talked about the actual process, the early morning appointments, the injections, the actual procedure, and what that's like for you to eventually grow those eggs and then save them for future use. Well, that brings us to today, the additional considerations that we're talking about. We're talking about your money, your long-term planning, and legal issues. There are a lot of legal issues to consider when you're thinking about potentially freezing your eggs. Now, I'm a lawyer, licensed in Ohio and California, so these things are very top of mind for me, but a lot of people might not necessarily think about these kinds of decisions that you need to make about the property rights that you have when it comes to your eggs. And this is not just for single people too, by the way, people who are in committed partnerships who are thinking about preserving their fertility, you're gonna wanna listen up to this too. So to talk about this, I have an excellent guest today. She's been practicing in the area of assisted reproductive technology for about a decade. She's worked at an egg donor agency and a surrogacy agency. Her name is Molly O'Brien. She's with the International Fertility Law Group in Los Angeles, and she really knows the ins and outs of all of this from insurance benefits, and workplace benefits to the costs associated with these things if you're going to have to pay out of pocket and really a lot of the considerations that we need to take a look at holistically when we're thinking about family planning and then of course we get into the legal issues and the property rights at play when you're talking about freezing your eggs so without further ado let's bring her in right now molly thank you so much for joining me today on the three things to know podcast Thank you so much for having me, Stephanie. I'm very excited to be here. This area is fascinating right now. And what we are seeing, your law firm actually just published a blog on this, Mm -hmm. is an increase in egg freezing right now. Mm -hmm. Why are we seeing that happening? I think it's directly related to the pandemic. I think there's a lot of women who are not out there dating, (laughs) you know, it weren't for safety reasons. And so they're like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? I want to preserve my fertility. And this is an excellent way to do that. And you really know the ins and outs of this field from all sides of it. You worked at an egg donor agency and a surrogacy agency for quite some time. Tell me a little bit about that. That's actually how I got my start in the industry was working with those agencies. And um, it was wonderful. I got to see firsthand how the journey is built through the use of an egg donor and through a surrogate. And this was before I ever became a lawyer. And when I worked there, the owners of the company encouraged me to seek out getting a law degree. And I thought, oh, no, you guys are crazy. I shouldn't do that. I'm too old for that. And they said, oh, you really think you should. And so they kind of said, you know, this is a good idea. You should think about it. And I did. And that's how I moved into the legal side of things about seven years after I started in the industry. And you've been working in that field for quite some time now. So you're well established in this field Mm -hmm. of art law assisted Mm -hmm reproductive technology. We're going to get to that in a minute because there are a ton of legal considerations here that I think maybe people don't necessarily realize. Yeah. First though, I want to talk a little bit about the money. Obviously you're very familiar with the pricing of these things with your time working at those agencies and just, you know, the other things that you're involved with in this space. So let's talk about the upfront costs of egg freezing. That's a big consideration for people. What are we looking at there? So the egg freezing is going to range between 10 and $20,000, maybe a little bit more. 
maybe a little bit less, but I'd say that's about average. That's a lot of money for somebody to put into something that's not medically necessary. That's more of a preservation type thing. But yeah, that's what you're looking at. Okay, so when we're looking at the expenses there, you've got not only the testing beforehand, yeah. right? You've mm-hmm. got the actual procedure with all of the injections and mm-hmm. the office visits and the retrieval. Yep. And that's just kind of the upfront costs. Now, there are exactly long term right. costs here too. Tell us about those. You're totally on point with that. That's just to get this preserved. If you want to use those eggs in the future, then you have to thaw the eggs, you have to create embryos using sperm donor or, you know, somebody you know. And then there's the IVF for the implantation of those embryos. And that cost is exponentially higher. Like you're looking at an additional twenty to fifty thousand dollars depending on the clinic you work with and the packages that you might choose at that clinic. So like you said, this is just the start cost to later have the option of spending all that extra money to do it. But I'll tell you, everybody says it's worth it. (laughs) It's definitely a commitment too. And yes, if you can do it, absolutely too. And then, you know, that's the long-term cost. And then there's sort of the intermediate cost, by the way, too, while you're in that sort of limbo space, if you're freezing your eggs, of the storage. Yes. What does that run typically? Yearly storage storage fees. Yeah, yearly storage fees are going to be like $500 to $1,000 a month. I'm sorry, a year. Um, That's about what we typically see. Okay. So a lot to think about there. So something else that is important to talk about here and this is maybe something we're seeing some changes in this industry i want to talk to you about insurance coverage and employer Mm -hmm. benefits what are you seeing in terms of insurance coverage for this particular type of the fertility space right now okay that's an excellent question and it's a very hot topic (laughs) um there are a lot of different things in this in this kind of world that insurance doesn't cover right now And a lot of people are fighting really hard for things like fertility mandates in different states and for employers to cover certain things. So right now we're still fighting for basic fertility benefits. And a lot of these insurance companies and a lot of these employers, when it comes to insurance, they view something like egg freezing as optional and not medically necessary. And we're still fighting for the the truly medically necessary things. So I think that that's the first hurdle we've got is we've got to get the basic benefits in and then we can start adding things like fertility preservation. Um, But that's not a across the board thing. There are a lot of employers who are contracting with companies like Carrot or like Progeny, which specialize in adding riders to insurance policy so that people who work for that company can have certain fertility benefits. And in a lot of cases, they really encourage fertility preservation. And that's what I'd really like to see more of a trend towards because it's almost like preventative care in a way. A lot of times, I mean, this is a kind of a hidden benefit. A lot of times when you start doing these tests early and getting this stuff kind of arranged ahead of time, you might discover something that you needed to know sooner rather than later. So there are benefits to these insurance companies covering these types of things. And I hope that it becomes more and more and more and more in the future. Sure. That's a great point and something that I actually hadn't even thought of because if you are doing this preservation of your fertility, you might be doing some genetic testing. Mm -hmm. You might see some things that you might not have otherwise seen in your own medical history. That's an excellent point. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the employer benefits. I just want to share some statistics that I've come across. These are from the International Foundation of Employee Benefits Plans 2020 Employee Benefit Survey. Say that five times fast. (laughs) The number of organizations that are offering fertility benefits to employees, we have seen that increase over the past five years. That's according to this survey. Right now, overall, big picture. So we're talking all fertility benefits, the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. IVF, the medically necessary things when someone tries to actually have a baby right now. Mm -hmm. 30%, they're saying, of organizations are offering some type of benefits overall. Here's the interesting thing. Egg freezing particularly, that's increased. In 2020, there were 10% of organizations that they surveyed reporting that they covered egg freezing and preservation. Now, that's up. In 2016, only 2%, according to the survey. That's a pretty big jump. What do you think? What do you predict there? You think we're going to see something more exponential there? Are we plateauing? I sure hope so. I hope that that is indicative of a trend towards just making this part of fertility benefits. Um, it would be lovely to do that. One of the things that I think is tricky with the fertility benefits is in these insurance policies, they typically will define 
what allows you to get the benefit. And a lot of times these definitions are not favorable to a single woman who wants to freeze her eggs or even a same sex couple. Because the definition of infertility, which you need to meet in order to get these benefits is usually unprotected intercourse for a year with no successful pregnancy. Well, if you're a single woman or you're a same sex couple, you're never going to meet that qualification to access those benefits. So I think we need to work on adjusting the definition on top of making sure that everybody equally has access to these types of benefits. Mm, when we're looking at these things, these insurance plans in the law, definitions are everything. Yes. <laughs> they really are. Okay, so I want to talk about another another aspect of this that's a bit of a hot button issue, okay? So when we're thinking about the single person, we'll say the single woman just for ease of conversation right now, and you're talking about egg freezing benefits. Now, that sounds great if your employer is going to offer that if you're truly not ready to have children right now. But the question is here, is a major reason that people are freezing their eggs because they're not getting the support that they need from their employers in order to be able to successfully have a family and mm -hmm. a career? And how do we stop this egg freezing benefit that would be so great that I personally would love to have? Yeah but might also just be a Band-Aid that's really stopping people from getting the support they need and you know, letting employers kind of pass the buck around these other benefits that families really need. That's a really good point that you're making. And there should be a grassroots effort to work with employee benefits for family building, not just things like the medical coverage and help with that. Um, and there, you know, I think there are a lot of employers who are very in tune to that and they actually sell a lot of, hey, come work for us because we will we will help you with this. We understand this. We're okay with this. I think Google did a big thing a couple of years back that was just like mind blowing to a lot of people. And I, I hope to see more employers fall in line, but it's harder to get the small employers to kind of do that because it's it affects them more than it would a large company like Google or like Amazon or something like that. Mm hmm. My hope for this space is that we can just think about it more holistically and we don't necessarily think of the single person who's trying to family plan differently than the person that's in a committed right. relationship that's right. trying to family plan. Exactly right. Because the, the single person's plan could have been all along to be a single parent. Exactly. Yeah. And there are so many different ways that families are formed these days and that is kind of a backbone of a practice in assisted reproductive technology law mm -hmm. so let's switch now to talking about the legal aspect of things something you're doing day in and day out and you know something about this is as a lawyer part of the job is to plan for the unexpected right yes <laughs> and a lot of people don't necessarily think about something until it's a problem right in this particular area, I want to ask you really specifically, why might egg freezing be a good idea or a good option, not just for the single person, but maybe for someone who's also in a committed relationship right now? It's, so women have this clock, this time line, and the longer you wait to have children, the more likelihood you have of genetic issues, medical issues, and so forth. So if you don't, whether you're in a relationship or not, if you don't think you're ready to become a parent now, but you're getting close to that timeline of when it could be increasing significant risks, it's a good idea to go ahead and freeze um, eggs or embryos um, just to preserve your fertility. I mean, I think that's what it's all about is I know in five years, I definitely want to be pregnant and have a child. And therefore I'm gonna do this now even though I know I'm not ready now, but I will be then. And then you basically, that's insurance right there. You just have your insurance policy. It really is. And you know, you talk about planning for the unexpected too. Say you're in a committed relationship, say it's mm -hmm. a heterosexual relationship. And so mm -hmm. you're not dealing with a sperm donor. You're not dealing with an egg donor. Right. It's all your own stuff. My eggs, somebody else's mm -hmm. sperm. Even then, say you're married. Would you counsel or is it a conversation that you're having with any of your clients about maybe freezing some eggs as well, just from the property rights issue here? Well, that's an excellent and very astute question. I'm glad you brought it up because there's a lot of facets to this. So eggs being frozen are good and, and the science is getting better on those every day. But the science on freezing embryos, which is the sperm and the egg combined, 
is far above that. So if you freeze a, a batch of eggs, you might only get a few of them after they've been thawed. But if you freeze a batch of embryos, they might probably will almost all be good. So your statistics are better with embryos. But having said that, you've got a property rights issue. <laughs> so you will sign consent forms at a clinic. Anytime you go into a doctor's office, they're going to say, hey, what do you want to do with these? And if you're in a committed relationship and you're, pa you're a patient and your partner's a patient, then you two kind of own those things together if you're making embryos and things like that. So I think your question is, well, does it make sense to, to freeze the egg separate so that if there's a breakup or if there's um, a death in the, you know, can you still use those independently? And the answer is it could make sense, but there is this facet to it too. You do sign consent forms at the clinic, but there are other documents that you can have in place, like an estate plan for your genetic material that will govern what should happen in the event of a breakup, in the event one of the partners dies, can the other partner use those eggs or embryos in the future? And you can have a disposition that is clear about that in writing between the two of you that's separate from the clinic, although it should absolutely match all the forms you fill out at the clinic. <laughs> It should. And this is something that in a bit of my research, I've done a little bit of research on this. I've seen the issue with the medical consent forms. Yeah. If you don't have that planning in place, if you don't have that forethought to have that agreement because mm -hmm. things happen, it's it's yeah. kind of akin to a prenup, really, mm -hmm. like whether you're married or not. If you don't have that in place, these medical consent forms can be used as contracts between the patients yeah. sometimes. And that's a little tricky, right? It's very tricky. It's some of these consent forms are actually pretty thorough and they have you write in your answers as opposed to ticking a box. And courts in different states have found very differently when it comes to these types of things. They will look at how thoroughly was this filled out? Did they have an opportunity to think about it? Did they speak to a lawyer before they filled these things out? Those are all factors that will weigh into whether a consent form will be treated as a contract or not. It's very interesting stuff. It is absolutely fascinating, probably not as fascinating to other people who are interested in this <laughs> legal world. But, you know, as I was telling you before we got started here, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, I would absolutely be practicing in this field of law. Because in a lot of senses, it seems like the wild, wild west, really, you're really just making good policy here to help people mm -hmm. prevent a lot of heartache and mm -hmm. make families and making a lot yeah. of people really happy. It's the best. It's the absolute best job in the world. I love it. <laughs> And I also, too, just thinking about these medical consent forms, just one more point on this. You know, when I'm in a doctor's office, I guess it depends on what you're there for, right? But I'm right. thinking about the way I'm signing these forms. I'm like, yeah, 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 initial, yeah. initial, sure, 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 let's do the mm -hmm. thing, let's get it done, you know? Not necessarily in the mind frame thinking about, well, exactly. what if this happens? Right, and, and when you're sitting there with your partner, you're, you're full of love and you're full of hope. And <laughs> you might be in a totally different mental space five years later. Absolutely. Okay. So another legal issue that people might not think about when they think about the property rights aspect of freezing your eggs. Maybe you won't need them. Maybe yeah. you've got this insurance policy and then maybe you meet the love of your life. Maybe you decide to go ahead and uh, have a pregnancy the natural way and you don't end up needing the frozen eggs. What are some of the legal considerations at play if you think you might want to maybe donate these or give them to someone else if you don't end up using them? I, I love this question. I actually wrote a law review paper on this because people were creating embryos and freezing eggs and just abandoning them when they didn't need them anymore. And doctor's offices are like, well, what are we supposed to do? We have all these eggs and embryos. So the number one thing is that if you take the time to do something like this, you can't just drop it. You need to make a decision because these things do become part of your family's estate. It, you know, And doctors do have the right to thaw if you abandon them but no doctor's going to do that because the moment they do that you're going to walk in the door a week later and say hey i want those um, so the number one thing is you can't do nothing <laughs> number two you have to decide what your plan will be if you want to donate them to somebody else you can do that with a simple donation agreement that can be done if you want to help somebody else if you want to thaw them naturally so that they just you know become one with the universe again you can absolutely do something like that you can also donate them to science or donate them to medical research. That's something you can do. There's a lot of options, but my personal belief is the only option you can't use is ignoring it and just letting them stay at the doctor's office. 
Right. And you've already taken all these proactive steps to do this thing. Just, you know, take it one step further, have that plan in place, makes it simpler for everyone. And it saves a lot of messiness, which is what this is all about. Yes, exactly. Okay. One other thing that we need to touch on here, because this was a very big deal here in Ohio. Mm Mm-hmm. There was a major tragedy here. There was a storage issue at one of the hospitals in the area, at University Hospitals. There were so many stored frozen eggs and embryos that were lost because of that issue. And some people are still in legal battles over trying to be compensated for that terrible loss. Is there anything that people should watch out for in those kinds of agreements that could maybe kind of safeguard against that terrible, terrible possible situation? Definitely. I have a couple of thoughts here. So thought number one is how do you ever compensate somebody if that was their only chance at fertility? Mm -hmm. Um, I have a very good friend of mine who received some cancer treatment in his twenties. And right before he started the treatment, his doctor said, Hey, freeze some sperm, make some embryos, do your thing. Right. Cause he was married at the time. And think about if that, those, that was their embryos and that was their only chance. Like how do you compensate somebody for that? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, But then to talk about how do you prevent this? It's not, preventable entirely because science isn't perfect but there are things that you can do that will at least make you feel better about your decision and research 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 is the first thing look into what the clinic's practices are how often do they check the temperature on those do they have rfid radio frequency identification do they have some sort of thing that indicates if the tank is getting low if you know those sorts of things what about um inventory are they checking the inventory on that frequently and making sure that everything their paperwork says they have is actually what's in the storage containers. That kind of research with each individual clinic that you might be looking at will give you a good peace of mind to know that your preservation is safe and ready for you when you're needing it. Okay. Yeah. Nothing you want to have to think about, but again, we got to sort of plan for the unexpected here. And another thing too, we should just mention, you know, as we're saying, anything could happen egg freezing and this stuff is not foolproof but you hope for the best you really do you hope if you're using this as an insurance sort of policy Mm -hmm. that you can eventually use them to have the family you hoped to have one day Mm -hmm. now molly before i let you go here you've given us so much great information is there anything else that you would like people to think about to sort of plan for success if they are thinking about going down the road of egg freezing definitely talk to a psychologist definitely talk to an attorney and interview more than one physician. You want to make sure that the choice you make is something you feel good about. Don't just go to somebody because you're friended or whatever the case might be. Do your research, look at statistics, and make a good decision that you will feel good about. And then on a personal note, I froze my eggs when I was younger. And one of the scariest things for me, even after having been in this industry for so long, was the shots. I was like, I'm terrified of needles. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through it. And I will attest as a needle phobe, it was not that bad. <laughs> so suck it up for the you know week to two weeks. It's totally worth it to know that you've got it done. It's really not that bad. You will do it. You will be fine. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, Molly. I've also frozen my eggs, and that was the scariest part for right? me. After the first one, though, I was like, all right, we could do this. We could I do got this. a system down after the first day, and I, you, you know, you get your system, and then you're like, boom, 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 and you've got it, and it's... It's really not that intimidating, but it, it is until you do it. And then you're like, oh, no, I got this. Mm-hmm. The scariest part sometimes is the unknown, right? which is why <laughs> I am so thankful for you coming on today, talking about all of this, because, you know, with some good planning, you can really set yourself up for success and prevent a lot of heartache yes. <laughs> really down the road. I agree. Thank you so oh. much for having me. It was great to get to talk about these things. Thank you, Molly. I really appreciate your time. Molly is so great. I could have talked with her all day about the nuance of fertility law and egg freezing, and that was so great of her to share her experience with us. The fact that she's done it just adds to her expertise in this area. Now, speaking of actually having done egg freezing, I want to circle back to something we talked about in the first episode on this series about the testing. And I said I was going to go back and I was going to get my AMH blood level retested. So I did. So I just wanted to share that with you all. It didn't really change. It hasn't really changed in the last two years. So I'm kind of right in the same ballpark. It's at 1.73. So that was refreshing for me to know that there hasn't been a lot of change over the past two years after I was able to get that birth control out of my system. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, go back and listen to the first podcast in this series all about testing and how to know if you're a good candidate for egg freezing. 
And that brings us now to what you need to know in NEO. And this is just a fun place where you can go and if you're having a bad day, if you're having a good day, you can check this place out and it will definitely put a smile on your face. I'm talking about the Affogato Cat Cafe in Tremont. There are so many reasons that I love this place. First of all, it's Cleveland and Northeast Ohio's first cat cafe. And you might be wondering, what is a cat cafe? Well, it's a cafe where you can go get coffee and snacks on one side and you can visit with rescues and potentially adopt them on the other side. But here's what I really love. You guys know that I love a good pun. Well, Affogato is an espresso, a hot espresso with some ice cream or gelato or something in it. But gato actually means cat in Spanish. So this is the perfect name for the cat cafe in Tremont. You gotta check it out. The cafe is takeout only right now, but you can visit and hang out with the cats and set up an appointment for a potential adoption by reservation. They're open Friday through Sunday. The hours are varying each day. So you're gonna wanna check out their website, which is affogatocatcafe.com or give them a call before you come and you can make a reservation to hang out with one of those pretty kitties on the Instagram page. There's a link there in their bio and the Instagram account is Affogato Cat Cafe. Speaking of Instagram, your a good follow this week is Abby Frank and this is an account that is worth paying attention to. The whole things we've been talking about throughout this series, right, has been what are we gonna do with our free time? How are we gonna value our free time? What will we do to preserve our fertility for the future if we're not ready to have kids? Well, the, <laughs> there's no way around it. When you have kids, your free time is a little bit more limited. So Abby is a good follow if you've got some free time and you wanna check out the great things that Cleveland has to offer. Her Instagram account is Cleveland underscore girl, but it's G-R-L, no I, okay? Cleveland underscore G-R-L on Instagram. And she is highlighting some of the best, the coolest, the newest things that the Northeast Ohio and Cleveland area has to offer. She's a Northeast Ohio native. She's originally from Youngstown. She moved to Cleveland after bopping around about four years ago. By the way, she's lived outside of Ohio too. She lived in New York, she lived in Kentucky, so she's got some insight and some perspective into how great Cleveland really is. And this is something that I tell people all the time having lived in New York and Los Angeles is that Cleveland really has everything. You know, we've got lake life, we've got incredible green spaces, we have city living, we have it all. And Abby really highlights that on her Instagram page. So her account, again, on Instagram, Cleveland underscore GRL. Make sure you check her out and give her a follow because she really is a good follow, especially while we're heading into the summer when everything is opening up and people are really ready to get out there and enjoy everything that we have kind of been put on hold for enjoying over the past year and a half. Okay, that's it for this week's Three Things to Know with Stephanie Haney. Thank you so much for being here. If you are enjoying the show, I would love it if you would leave a review and a rating and also subscribe and maybe share it with your friends because sharing is caring. I will see you back here next week, everybody. Thanks for listening to Three Things to Know with Stephanie Haney from WKYC Studios. Subscribe now to stay in the know.